Teresa McDuffie. I am president of the Francis Marion University African American Faculty and Staff Coalition. Welcome to Beyond Mother Emanuel and the Confederate Flag, a symposium on race, culture, and understanding. Bishop Donald Jackson of the Fellowship of Christian Ministries will deliver our invocation. Let us pray. Most holy, wise, and everlasting Father, once again we come to you meek and humble as we know how. We want to thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together on this occasion. Father, as we begin to endeavor on this particular subject, race, culture, and education, Help us to realize according to thy word that you have made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on this earth and that in you we move and live and have our being. We thank you, O God, for the diversity that you have placed in this earth, likewise on this institution. And Father, we thank you for education because you said in your word, any lack wisdom to ask you who give it to every man liberally. So Father, as we begin to endeavor this, we ask you, O oh God, let everything be done in decent and in order. We ask you to bless mankind everywhere, every man, woman, boy, and girl, from the White House on down. Realize that you set up and you take down and that nothing happens except you allow it. Help us to accept what you allow. Father, look on our speaker. We thank God, O oh God, for his life. One you have allowed, O oh God, to go through, O oh God, the turmoil and can stand today and speak to us concerning the history thereof. Father, bless this university and universities throughout the entire world and the earth, every educational institution, let your blood cover and let your angels encamp. God, those that have lost loved ones, we ask you to comfort them only as you know how. And Father, we ask you to bless us. And when you've blessed all, God, remember me. Keep me meek and humble that I might be meet for the master's use. Bless us, O God, both spiritually, physically, and financially. It is in thy name we pray. Amen. This is the third and final day of our symposium. On day one, our lecture was on politics, policy, and symbols. And we heard our speaker's name several times. On day two, our lecture was on art, community, and healing. And again, we heard our speaker's name. Today, our lecture is on race, culture, and education. Cleveland Sellers was born in Denmark, South Carolina, and attended Voorhees College. In 1964, he went to Mississippi as a part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's Freedom Summer and the next year was elected the organization's program director in which capacity he participated in the famous march from Selma to Montgomery led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In 1968, he helped organize a protest of segregated bowling alleys in Orangeburg, South Carolina. An incident which resulted in the killing of three South Carolina State students by highway patrol officers and which is now known as the Orangeburg Massacre. He was the only person jailed for the Orangeburg Massacre. He served seven months in jail after being convicted for a riot charge. He received a full pardon 23 years after the conviction. There has never been an investigation. He is currently the president of Voorhees College. Our speaker, Dr. Cleveland Sellers.
use the uh, hand mic, and I'll go over and start over here, and then we will um, we will do a little little discussion here today rather than a a drawn out lecture. My uh, discussion will cover. Um, my experiences in South Carolina race relation. It will uh, talk about the civil rights movement and kind of chronicle uh, some of the events that I think are significant. One of, the f one of the areas that I will concentrate on is the involvement of young people. And a lot of times that's missed in our uh, civil rights narratives and uh, civil rights uh, books where we don't uh, talk about the courage and determination and the kind of commitment of, of young people. And the other is the, the lack of a lot of narrative on women and their en enrolled and involvement in, in civil rights, especially the civil rights movement. So what I wanted to do was kind of talk about a, a Cleveland Sellers and how I evolved and then uh, get you to see some of the pictures inside the movement to kind of get you to thinking about uh, what was going on during that period. My uh, thought is, is that if we don't know this history, we are doomed to repeat it. And it looks like it's right on the edge of where we might be going. Uh, when people ask me, well, where do, we, where do you think you are and where, where is race relations in 2018, I say we're just about at 1953. So that's an indictment, but we have to recognize that indictment in order for us to figure a way to get out of the hole we're in. So uh, that's where I'll start. And I want to start in about 1944 was the year that I was born. And uh, I wanted to show you a picture of me in 19, uh, this must be about 1947, 1948. <laughs> oh, you see it. Okay. Um, I, I add a little bit of, of humor to it, but you'll figure that out as I go along, why I start out that way. Um, uh, this is, my mother put this uniform together, and what you can see on it is a V here. And I'll go fast so we can get through and, and have an opportunity to have some discussion and answer some questions. But it was for Voorhees College. So I was the mascot in 1947 for Voorhees College football team. And this is probably homecoming. But I'm, I'm growing up in, uh, in a period where there is segregation. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, but there are rules to go along with it, what I call uh, segregated etiquette. And it, it talked about how you could move and operate and how much control or lack of control you had on, over your own destiny. Uh, that was a period that many youngsters, many students who are in school now don't remember, don't know anything about. But let me, take, let me give you an example of the etiquette. If I was walking down the street and I came up on a family, it was a white family, maybe it was three of them. I had two options. First option was to get off the street and then there wouldn't be anything. The second one was that I should cast my eyes down and not make eye to eye contact. Eye to eye contact was considered to be belligerent. And there were penalties you paid for being unlawful. And so you could actually uh, be uh, disciplined for that, uh, arrested, any number of things could happen. Uh, we talk about the separation. The separation was very rigid. And therefore, you did have inside of communities two separate and distinct communities, but African Americans developed institutions that made up for some of that, that difference. But there was always the effort made to uh, change things and move further. So even at this period of time here, when I look like I might be happy, I'm not sure, I don't have a smile on my face, there were other things that were going on at the same time. And let me show you an example, and I'm going to ask you to tell me what this is. Yes. You know this gentleman? 
And you know that he was the first 14 year old in the country executed for a crime we still don't know if he had anything to do with it. I think that was the judgment. We'll, we'll let that one go. But I, I put him down because when I was coming along, we all looked alike. That wasn't by choice, but that's what it was. So I, I do that because I want to talk about South Carolina because there was a period in which there was civility in South Carolina. And that simply means that you do what the law say to the strictest extent. But if you look at something like the desegregation of schools, 1954 Briggs versus Elliott, and then the Brown versus, um, um, uh oh, Board of, Board of Education. All right, we got it. Um, you will you will know that in South Carolina, uh, the Brown uh, case impacted South Carolina in 19. 54, like it did every other place in the country. But it was only in 1972 when there was a real effort to have desegregated schools in South Carolina. And even though you had, uh, we had them, uh, you might remember some of those incidents that we went through. Lamar, South Carolina brings back memories to me. That was the South Carolina that I grew up in. But for many of us who were in those segregated schools, we found that our teachers were heroes and sheroes because they made sure that we got the nurturing. They tried to protect us from that uh, segregation because segregation was not just mean, it was violent and it was confusing. And so if you didn't know what to do um, and how to treat those things, you always had someone that you could go to to help you with that. One other thing, I had a civics book in the eighth grade. And in my civics book, they made references to, uh, to uh, African Americans. And they said that African Americans were like children playing hooky while the teacher was away. They stole, they ran through the streets, they didn't know anything. And that was the way I was supposed to be introduced to civics in South Carolina. And then they concluded by saying, if it had not been for the Ku Klux Klan, which scared the superstitious Negroes into submission, um, that we would not have the state that we have today. And that was what two races, separate and distinct, had to be had to worry about as they go forward. That's just a paraphrasing of it, and that's Sims, our, our um, author of that. Moving right along quickly, we're gonna move pretty fast now. We're talking about 1954, and uh, 1954 was brown. Show me some brown. You got to keep going, this is, <laughs> this is a long ways, and I just wanna make sure that we get people to know what it is that we're talking about. Because a lot of people are lockstep. We think about Selma when we think about civil rights, and we think about the March on Washington when we think about civil rights, but all during that period of time, there were a lot of people who could serve and were asked to serve, and they did their small part in making a difference in the movement. And here you have Thurgood Marshall, who spent time down in uh, South Carolina with Jessica Simpkins and uh, Matthew Perry and the likes, and uh, James Nabreth over there, who later became one of the uh, the attorneys in the in the um, in the Brown case, who later became the president of Howard University. And you can see school segregation ban, and I think you'll see that's 1954. So when I say that it took that long period of time, we can we can talk about how and what was going on to get us to the point where 1972, we, we desegregated schools in, uh, in South Carolina. Um, 1955, 1955 is a very interesting year. And this is where my social consciousness come from. Anybody know who this young man is? Emmett Till, yes. 
Emmett Till was the person that obviously created a tremendous amount of concern with me. I, I consider myself and many of the others who were involved in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, say that we come from the, from the Emmett Till generation. That's who we were. And I went to school because I had a Jet magazine, that's the black publication that came into the homes, of this figure on the cover. And my question was, was that I was a little younger than Emmett Till. My question was, but I could relate to him. You know, anytime you get to be about 10, uh, 11, you, you're just about wise enough to be able to think, you know, with the 15 and 16 year olds. My question and concern was, why did this happen to him? And the uh, teachers would tell us, the question you really need to ask is, how are you going to respond to this? And so it becomes very important for us to begin to talk about ways in which we could actually impact society so that uh, we could keep this kind of thing from going on. But this is just a clear case of segregation overall. Very, very simple, plain and simple. And this is a picture of, of uh, Emmett Till before that. But it was so horrendous, this murder of Emmett Till by, by two whites in, um, in, uh, in Mississippi. And now the, the, the woman who had, he allegedly said something smart to, and that was the only act of, of commission of any kind of thing that, that occurred, is now saying none of it ever happened. And I don't know why then, you know, her husband and her brother would go out at night, kidnap him, take him off into the woods and beat him to death and then shoot him and then uh, put a, uh, a, a gin fan around his ankle and throw him in the river. And so uh, we looked at that and used that as a beginning. Move to next. This is Emmett Till's mother who insisted, because everybody was saying that, you know, the head and the face were so badly that she shouldn't show them. And her response was, I will show the world what happened to my son in Mississippi. And so that was widespread and people responded to, uh, to the Emmett Till uh, kind of uh, assassination here early on. But we were riled up and we were beginning to develop a social consciousness. That becomes important. All people have to develop that social consciousness. And it comes from different kinds of things. If you want to understand what it is that I'm talking about in terms of a social consciousness for a young person, you can see it in the students at Parkland, developing that social conscious. We have to do something to keep this kind of thing from continuing to happen. And so I wanted to show you this, and at the same time, I wanted to make, begin to make those connections. Moving right along. And then after Emmett Till, you had Rosa Parks. And I have to bring her here sometimes to show people because you can see she is a, a middle-aged woman who is trying to do something to change her condition, trying to get control of her life. And, uh, you know, the narratives now, if you read them and, you, and you're not very cautious, <clears throat> many of the narratives say that Rosa Parks got tired of standing up and wanted to sit down. That's where they tell the history. But it takes away from her the authority to say, I do not want to go through this segregation anymore. And that becomes very important. So sometimes we, we, we uh, see something happen and see some kids or young people or students respond to it. It's not within the uh, proper, traditional, polite uh, channels. And we are upset because they think <clears throat> that there is something that they need to do in order to change those circumstances and those situations. 1960. Now we have another baby 
Who is this? Ruby Bridges. Okay. Ruby Bridges is going to first grade. And uh, there's a mob out of about a thousand people, many of whom are shouting that the police let her go so they can lynch her. She goes to school in her first year in school, there is not a classmate in school with her because the white children would not go to that, those classes that she was in. And I want you to see this and, and, and tell you symbolically what this, what, what this is look like. This is probably three feet and she has US marshals around her and police to keep her safe to go to school at six years old. So I just want to get you to understand that obviously there's a social consciousness that, that develops with her uh, back through this process. And then you begin to look all over South Carolina, you had cases in which black students would go to uh, predominantly white schools to try to desegregate them. What kind of traumas did they go through? What kind of pain and suffering that they went through? Did they go through? Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to shape the belief, you know, that you can have young people who are really committed to the ideas and principles of freedom, freedom, and are willing to work on those strategies that helped that process along. Move along. Just a picture of SNCC, a pen. This is the standard logo uh, for SNCC. And you can see the hands clasped. Move on. 1961. Um, and, and I get a little bit ahead of myself here because we do have the sit-ins that come in between these. But some of the students after the sit-ins took place, Greenville, the sit-ins came right down what is I-85, down I-77, on down to Atlanta and cross over to Birmingham and Alabama and all those other places. But this is uh, the Freedom Rides. They were a little different. Sit-ins, I mean, the sit-ins where you go in and you sit and you ask to be served. And after a certain period of time, uh, they would either close the, the, the stand down or they would uh, have you arrested or put you out. One of all three, uh, all of them. Um, and this is a bus that, that got through South Carolina and made it down to, um, to uh, Anderson, Alabama. And then the bus got stopped and there was uh, the, the, what did you call the, the accel accelerators? Yeah. Were put in the back of the bus so they could beat the, uh, the students when they came out the bus. So that was the general idea. But you, you, this picture is pretty much a shot of the bus. If we can do the next picture, you can see some of the people. That's Hank Thomas right there. And that's some of the other riders up here and one over there. And you can see the entire bus burn up. Um, fortunately, you didn't have somebody kill on, at this event. But this event tells us again that we as activists put our lives on the line. And there is the possibility that you would end up getting killed. But you made that kind of commitment and you had that kind of integrity to step up and do what needed to be done. So uh, this did not end the, the uh, Freedom Rides. Uh, the Congress of Racial Equality, which had set up the Freedom Rides, decided to pull out because they thought it was just too violent and they couldn't protect the people who were riding. So Diane Nash from uh, SNCC in Nashville decided to go to Alabama, find another bus that they got in to go on to Mississippi. So the Freedom Rides continued until after the federal government found that they had a provision already in law that made it illegal to not allow people to, uh, to go into public facilities and use those facilities without having segregated facilities available to them. Moving on. 
Now, this is a picture of some of the people who were uh, Freedom Riders, and they're showing their posters. This used to be the criteria you used to get into a civil rights organization. You know, you would, you would, you, you had time served somewhere. You had, you'd gotten arrested or pushed down or spit on or something. Something had to be, and so this worked. This is uh, John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis right there. Jim Lawson, who was the kind of philosopher in the movement that, that developed the, the, the philosophy around uh, nonviolent direct action and nonviolence and those kinds of things. And he worked with SCLC. And uh, this is James Farmer, who was head of the Congress of Racial Equality. And uh, Dave Dennis is up. He's con uh, Congress of Racial Equality. Um, and uh, Bevel, James Bevel, up there. And a few more people on there. But I just wanted to give you some ideas. Now, let me tell you, during the period of segregation, if a black man got arrested, that was it. You weren't going to go to school. You weren't going to get a job. You weren't going to be able to register to vote. You weren't going to be able to do anything. Getting arrested meant that you had ended the line in terms of your opportunities being open to you. That's a fact. And so it wasn't an easy decision to make to go to jail. Because if you went to jail, that meant that you had kind of written yourself off. And that continued throughout the movement, in which we had COINTELPRO and and other kinds of programs that, that made an effort to uh, undermine who we were and, and uh, dis disseminate misinformation, all those kinds of things. Changing the narrative is a key to the strategy for those who were running things. Move right along quickly. And I'm, I'm skipping ahead again. But we had Birmingham, and this is uh, a young lady who is about to go to jail. And I said, look at these pictures so you can get a sense of what is going on. Obviously, she feels good enough, even though there are one, two, I thought I saw another policeman somewhere. There he is. Mm -hmm. Ah, it is three. But she's getting ready to go to jail in Birmingham for Project C, Confrontation SCLC. You remember the, the dogs and the fire hoses and all that kind of stuff? She is getting ready to go to jail, but she ain't scared. I mean, you have to understand what you go through. You, you, you just transform it. I will go irregardless of what it is that will be the consequences. I would hope I will survive it, but I'm not even sure about that. But I'm not going to be frightened of it anymore. Because for many of those people who were involved in the civil rights movement knew that we were in death's way all the time. But uh, we found ways in which we could conquer fear and move through it. It's something that needs to be done and had to be done. And we did it and moved on. Moving on down the line. And this is a, a woman. And I'm going to tell you some cultural secrets here. When you have your hair done up like this, it ain't supposed to be on the ground, OK? Y'all know what I'm talking about? OK. Now, you can see that he is trying to get her down and, and get into submission with his knee on the throat. This is, uh, I think, uh, Boynton in, uh, in uh, Selma, Alabama. And those are Selma police right there, and she was a school teacher. So she's out with the school teachers who came out risking everything again. And uh, this is the way she was escorted off to jail after they had uh, gotten control over. Move on. And then we go past, um, no, this is, this is um, after. But uh, we, we go on to, and this is out of place too, but I'm going to put it in, and we're going to go on down the list, because I got a whole bunch of stuff for you to see. Um, this is Birmingham. 
This is the 16th Street Baptist Church. You can see that the basement is completely blown out. The dynamite was placed in the basement. And it was placed in the basement because that's where Sunday school was held. And the children who had gone through Birmingham and met the fire hoses and the dogs and all that used the 16th Street Baptist Church to meet so they could go out and face those, those kinds of things. So it was deliberately set. And we move next to the four little girls that were killed in the church, 11 to 14. And many of the other ones had uh, lost sight, burned badly, and that kind of thing. During the time that the church was burning, there were two other youngsters, one 14, and I think the other one might have been 12, that were on a motorcycle and got shot and killed. So those kind of things slipped through the, through the, um, through the cracks. Moving on, oh, move on. That's just me and some other folk, but we'll get back to enough pictures of me. I don't want to hold up. And, and after the Birmingham demonstrations, in August you had to march on Washington, okay? And that's Dr. King with the I Have a Dream speech. And I told people that, you know, you're, you're looking at stuff and you, you, can't, you can't really tell who people are. And I was talking about these little, these little white hats. See the white hats there? Those were police officers from New York and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., who wanted to do something with the march on Washington. Um, and so they came as security. And the way they were identified, nobody knew what the white hats represented, was to other policemen, was to wear these white hats. And I, I say that because, you know, we, we generally, you know, we're about a three second kind of group now. I mean, if, if you can get it in in three seconds, or tweet it in three seconds, uh, you'll, get the, you'll get the message through. But otherwise, that doesn't, that doesn't come over. And my point is, is that the whole of the African American community was engaged in talking about freedom and justice and equality and better education, health care, and all those kinds of things. Isn't it ironic that we are back to that now, talking about health care and the need for it and, and, and uh, the schools, upgrading the schools and having a quality education? We, we look like we have come complete circle and back around again. But I just wanted to show you that when we move on. 1964. Now that's, that's a picture of me, and I want to say I'm coming from Howard University. I, I leave school and I go to Mississippi. That summer in uh, Mississippi, there were f about 800 students from all of the major universities, including Clemson and um, other southern schools that uh, sent delegations to, uh, to the Mississippi Summer Project. And I was the uh, director in uh, Holly Springs, Mississippi. So I'm here talking to three master teachers and a nurse. And what we found in, in Mississippi to need a nurse was that the, the kinds of scurvy and the other kinds of diseases that come from malnutrition and all were very rampant. And people wanted to know what could they do about those kind of things. Now, I say that. Uh, letting you know that there was a food crisis in South Carolina in which those same kinds of things were going on. I don't know whether or not it's still happening, but I do know that there are a lot of hungry black children during the summer when you don't have the school programs, lunch programs to uh, work with. So uh, we are working down there and we, we move on. We gonna go quickly. This is uh, Sharna. Cheney, no, Sherna, Cheney, and, Good, and Goodman. These are the three young men that left the orientation that I was at and went to Mississippi. One of the things I had to do was to go down shortly after we concluded that they were dead and see if I could find them. So I'd go out at night and we'd look, a group of us, it was eight of us, and during the day, we would stay in the barn or in the loft of the barn of a farm out there. 
at the point where we felt like we were going to um, be spotted, we didn't want to give the farm up, so we left. And uh, three months later, they found the bodies of Goodman, Sherman, and Cheney on the other side of the county, Neshoba County in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Go ahead. This is the car that they were in. They were arrested twice. The first time they were taken into the police station and, and harangued and challenged and all that kind of stuff. The second time, the deputy sheriff um, pulled them over again, and then he turned them over to the, to the Ku Klux Klan. And they came into town and killed them. Next one. That's the bodies when they were found in an earthen dam. And these were colleagues. These were my friends. Now it is that you are changing from an 18-year-old who was saying, I, I, I joined the movement and I put my body in the movement, to now I have to ask other people to make the same kinds of risk. It's a heavy, heavy, heavy load to have to carry especially at 17, 18, and 19 years old. And many of the students in Mississippi for that summer were that age. Um, and that was the consequences. That would have been the same fate if we had gotten caught out there. We had gotten caught out there in, uh, in looking for the bodies. Uh, that would have happened to us. <coughs> Moving on, 1965, now. We are now moving past, and we'll get some of these things out of place, so just loop them. Uh, this is um, a picture after the, uh, Black Power comes out, and that was the Mississippi Meredith March against fear in Mississippi. And you see on here, that shows truly on the right, okay? <laughs> and that's Muhammad Ali on the extreme left, and that's Stokely Carmichael there, and Elijah Muhammad is right there, head of the Nation of Islam at that point. Um, and, and we are talking with black leaders and, and others about black power, even talking to uh, um, some of the people out in Tennessee. And we had a lot of people who we were talking about how we develop that black power thing. And now you have people who are saying, well, you know, that, that's what split the movement up and it didn't do any good, uh, any of that kind of thing, but that's what won the presidential election for Obama. So you have to recognize that there is something that comes out of pulling together. That's also what helped the senator in Alabama not long ago. That same kind of pulling together and getting Willie to go down and vote. You know, you have to keep Willie home all night the night before. And y'all know why. And then you had, to, you had to tell him that, you know, once he voted, then it was okay for him to do whatever it is that he wanted to do. Moving down, and this is the uh, new regime that took over. I served as program director of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in uh, two, two terms. And the first term was with John Lewis, who was chairman. The second term was with Stokely Carmichael, who was chair chairman. Ruby Dodge Robinson Smith, tough as nails. And James Foreman, not Farmer, this is Foreman now, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Moving on. In 1965, uh, this is a picture of us at the, uh, the, the South African consulate's office in, uh, New, in New York. And we have gone to, pot, to protest apartheid because now we are looking at ways in which we can be tied in with other people who were fighting for liberation and freedom and justice and equality. Uh, the second person up here is yours truly. Uh, Bill Hall is the person on the extreme left. And this is Willie Ricks right here. For those who don't know Willie Ricks, Willie Ricks is the person who coined the phrase black power. And that's Jim Foreman up there, John Lewis. And we ended up at Rikers Island. Some of you who know something about New York know that that's the notorious prison in, 
in New York, and we had um, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier came to bail us out of jail. I was so happy to see them <laughs> because I did not want to go to Rikers Island. I, had, I ended up going to a whole lot more, but that's one I didn't want to go to. And then shortly after that, you see the urban rebellions taking place starting in 1964 in Harlem and Philadelphia in the next year, 66 uh, Watts, Detroit, 67. And I'm just giving you the, the larger ones so that you can wrap that all into one. Uh, moving along, I'm going all the way back and I just have to show some of my younger students what it looked like. This was the ladies room, the men's room, and whoever wanted to go in the other room. This is where it was set up. The water fountains were like that, and usually the water fountains that made a difference were uh, the ones that had the cold water in it, and those were not for coloreds. Uh, you, you had running water, and it was probably not kept clean and that kind of thing. But just think about that sometimes when you're going to a fast food place, and on the back where the squawk box is, I guess you all still call it the squawk box. I don't know. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sign over the door saying employees only. That's where black people went. Knocked on the door and asked for the hamburger and the Coca-Cola. And they'd take your money and go inside. Then they'd come back out and hand it to you and say, we'll see you later. But you aren't coming inside to eat this. Just think about how humiliating that must have been. Just think about it. I'm not asking you to do anything. Just think about it. All right, let's go. And that's a picture in um, Boston. And that shows truly on the right. But I wanted to begin to show you the hairstyle. <laughs> um, because uh, that might have been one of the things that got me in a little trouble. Move on. <laughs> and this is on the Mississippi Meredith March. That's Floyd McKissick right here. He became the new director of uh, the Congress of Racial Equality after James Farmer left. Jose Williams up there, Dr. King, yours truly, Stokely Carmichael, and uh, I keep forgetting his name, Bernard, Bernard Lee. That's who that is. And one of the things you will see with Bernard Lee is, is that he was always with, with Dr. King, always. And what you will see is they, they would dress alike. And what the idea was, was that he is a deterrent. If somebody is going to come out and they're going to take a pot shot, which one is it, you know? And in that time, you might have a way to defend yourself against whatever is coming at you. Moving on. And this is where black power was actually uh, said out there. And Dr. King is somewhere on the right when this is, this is done and Stokely is saying black power, black power, he's pointing down, he's emphasizing. And you see some eyes rolling over there on the side up there. That shows truly again. The only thing you can see is the white of my eyes moving along. And this is uh, Reverend Lawson here. And this is where we began the march after, um, after James Meredith is shot when he goes out. And so you have Floyd McKissick, Yost Truly, the same folk. And you see that uh, Bernard is holding uh, Stokely back. This policeman comes over and pushed the crowd. And uh, I fell down on the ground. Um, but I'm glad I was up here so I could get in the picture. Go ahead. 1967. This is 1967 U.S. Army Armed Forces Induction Station. Uh, I am uh, 20, 22, I think it is. And I'm being called to selective service to the military. And I, I, had, a, a, um, I had an issue with my heart. And I said I should be uh, let go and not go in. But the state of South Carolina, after I filed suit against them, that the selective service in both South Carolina and Georgia were all white. 
that uh, they decided to take me in anyhow, and I decided not to go. So moving along, and you can begin to see all the reasons why we get to 1968, why the state has already set up. Uh, I am not a, uh, a welcome uh, South Carolinian to most people in the state of South Carolina. I decided to come back to South Carolina. I went to Orangeburg. When I got to Orangeburg, the students there had already targeted the bowling alley because it had a members only sign in the window in 1968. The 1964 Civil Rights Bill is four years old. And uh, they began to protest. And there was a series of protests where the violence escalated every night. Not the violence on the part of the students, but the violence on the part of law enforcement and people they allowed to come onto the campus. There were two shootings on Wednesday night that most people don't talk about. One was with two youth, white youth, who drove onto the campus. They drove down the street that had a dead end. They turned around and came back off. And when they got back, when they got back off, the, the, um, the, the um, students who were out there and saw them threw bricks and bottles at the cars when they were coming off the campus. So the passenger began to fire randomly just out of the car. He unloaded a, I, I guess, a six-round uh, gun in, in, in the area of students. Nobody was hit at that point. Later on that night, some students were going off the campus to the, to the um, hamburger joint. And when they were going, they, they went through the, the backyard of a white family. And what happened there was that the, uh, the man who saw them had been told by the FBI that they were burning down houses and they were doing all this kind of disruptive stuff. And so he shot them, but he shot them with bird shot. So they survived. And so they got patched up and went on, went on home. Moving on. And on that Thursday night, this is the scene, and this is Henry Smith here and Sam Hammonds here. Not Sam Hammonds, uh, Delano Milton there. That's, he is a high school student, 16-year-old high school student that got shot and killed. These two were killed. Uh, this, this is the law enforcement. You can see the helmets. They aren't all wearing white helmets, but these are highway patrolmen here. And you see where he has his foot. I guess he's trying to shake him and see whether or not he's dead or alive. But it, it doesn't seem that you would use your foot on that. But nevertheless, we move on. Move on. These are the three young men that got killed on that night. And there were some 43 other students that were injured, shot in the back. Most 80% of the students who were shot were shot in the back. When the first volley went off, they turned to run away. And they never stopped shooting. Moving on. That's me when I was arrested, arrested on that same night. And uh, I had five felony charges. And we'll talk about a little bit of that, move on. And that's when I'm arrested. And I show young men that uh, when, you, when you're involved in some kind of protest, you know, have some hair on your hair <laughs> and uh, be stylish. I know you all are looking at that. And sometimes you can get young men who have kind of given up and lost hope, get them to smile on that one, and then you can begin to tell them about what it is that they can do that will make a difference. Dr. King used to always say that uh, the civil rights movement was about service, and everybody can serve. It's just a question of who and, and what. I remember on the Mississippi Meredith March that people used to come out with a jar of water. That's all they had an orange, or an apple, or a banana, because that's all they had. But they knew that they were giving it to Dr. King and it would make a difference. Moving on, 68. Um, this is late on in 68. And what we have is following the, the shooting in Orangeburg, you have the assassination of Dr. King four months later in April, April 4, 1968 and then Kennedy, and you have Lurleen Wallace dying, and you have a whole bunch of 
different things that are going on, the, the, the political convention and that kind of thing. And we're gonna move right now, move on along. This is Dr. King here. You, you can't see him, he has a cloth over him, but the, the bullet hit the, this side of the face and all that came off. Um, moving, moving, moving. Uh, that's me, uh, both of these pictures are me in prison. So uh, I, I show people that even in spite of the fact that there were difficulties, you have to find a way to get yourself through it. And now we have to be responsible for other people who are, who are killed. And that's a, that's a hard thing to do. Moving on, that's uh, my baby was, my oldest was born while I was in prison. And uh, Governor McNair would not give me the opportunity to go to Greensboro for the birth. And I thought that was, again, insult to injury. And that's, that's my, my wife. And you can see I have my, my shirt on here. I ended up with um, uh, a year of hard labor for a crime that was committed on the night of the 6th, not the, not the 8th. And when I was first arrested, I ended up being put on in the section where Pee Wee Gaston was placed, and that's on death row. So I say that that was all a part of, you know, kind of taking me down a notch. But I never let that come into play, and I used a lot of constructive things to kind of move me out. I wanted to teach. I wanted to be involved with African-American youth. I wanted to be involved with the processing of African-American history. It's so rich. Uh, it's, it's, it's not utilized in the manner that it needs to be utilized. And even in the state of South Carolina, you know, the largest industry in, in South Carolina is tourism. And there's no cultural tourism in many places. I think, uh, uh, Mayor Riley is going to take care of some of that down in Charleston with the new museum coming up, and I certainly do appreciate that. Moving along, this is me in the prison, and I, I show this picture now because I don't have to worry about anybody getting in any trouble. But uh, that's Stokely Carmichael in the red. That's him up there in the red again, and some of my other friends. But uh, we, got, we got him into the prison. So uh, we were able to pull that off. Nobody ever said anything about it, so I figured I got by with it. Move on. 79, that's just being pensive and, and moving. Go ahead. That's uh, me and my father and my mother. And I wanted to say that there was 25 years of exile from South Carolina. My parents didn't want me to come back to South Carolina ever because they were fearful of what might happen to me. And I wanted to come back because both were uh, cancer patients, um, but they died before I could ever come back. But I, I like to show them because they gave me support, especially when you had to deal with those real live situations. Moving along, 2000. Oh, this is Mayor Riley coming from Charleston to Columbia for the uh, taking down of the Confederate flag. And he has me carrying this flag. You don't see him out there, do you? <laughs> <laughs> he got me involved and then he, he had to go do some, some work. And we had to pass the Confederate flag on alongside and, and jeering people and all that kind of thing. Move on, move on. Oh, this is just some pictures of me and John Hope Franklin and uh, uh, Judge Matthew Perry. And that was when I was at the University of South Carolina. At Selma, if you go down and you see the Civil Rights Freedom Wall right outside of Brown Chapel, look down near the bottom, right there. And they just gave me recognition for being down there. I don't, I have never, and was taught not to uh, be concerned about what kind of, what kind of gratitude that you will get. You just have to keep moving and, uh, and, and out of that some good will come. You just have to be able to be uh, non-materialistic and, and kind of non-individualistic and I try to teach people how to do that because when I was working for SNCC we got 
$9.32 a week when we got it, okay? And that wasn't all the time. It wasn't all the time moving. And then I end up here so that you can see that I made it through all those steps. And uh, in spite of all the difficulties and come back to what you consider to be traditional. But I, don't, I still don't see myself as being traditional. So I wanted to just kind of end right there. I don't know how much time I've gone over, but I think we have covered some of the pictures. A couple of stories I want to tell you, and then I'm going to sit down. One is, is that Dick Gregory, who came to Birmingham when the kids were going to school, 3,447 students from Yay to Yay were arrested in Birmingham. They had so many students there, they opened up the, 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 the cow pens at the state fairground in order to keep them. And uh, the kids were going to school. They were coming out the windows. They were going out the door, past the teachers. The teacher would sometimes turn her back so she wouldn't see them leave, so she couldn't say how they got out or when they got out. But Dick Gregory came, and he got, he got there a little late. And the kids said, we're going to march. And they took off and went to march. And so Dick Gregory ended up going down, going to jail with the students who went to march. And that night, it was a little boy. He said the little boy was a tiny little fellow. And he asked the little boy, how old are you? And the little boy said, Thee, I am Thee. And so he then asked the little boy, he said, well, tell me, why are you in here? You know, this is the bad place to be. He said, Thee them. <laughs> Thee them. Conceptually, kids know. And I think we make a better person when we have people conscious, socially conscious. We have to have them do that. Now we have them so that they don't do anything that they're not asked to do, you know? And then they don't want to do it if there's not some residuals connected to it. And we, we ask, well, what are y'all going to do? Well, I tell them that the legacy for me is here. So I don't have to do very much more, but just kind of stay above ground. And it's their job, the new generation, to get this thing done. In terms of the Orangeburg Massacre, the Orangeburg Massacre will be the litmus test, listen up closely, the litmus test for race relations in the state of South Carolina. It's been 50 years, and there has been no study at all. How do we get past that? I talk about the Orangeburg Massacre and, and who it impacted, who were the victims. It was the South Carolinians, black and white, who thought that justice would prevail in South Carolina. Nothing happened in terms of the justice system, nothing. And then you had a couple of the, um, a couple of the uh, highway patrolmen ended up, one ended up being head of the highway patrol. And then about a year after the, the highway patrol got exonerated, they all got promoted, every single one of them. So we do not, address those pertinent issues. We go around the edges and we wait for a calamity or a tragedy like Charleston. And then we rush in and we do something, that's the end of it. We have to sit and talk and come up with a strategy in order for us to move forward. And I don't know about most of you, I live in a rural county and people are hurting all the time. It's a rural poor county. And that, that pain and suffering don't have a, uh, a age limit on it, and it doesn't have a color on it. It's everybody. And that it seems like to me that South Carolina and its state legislature have to come out of the 1800s and come into the 21st century and begin to do what it needs to do besides setting up little trust and all kinds of accounts and, and be robbing the people and get off. You can make $4 million and actually get off. Yeah, but if I were to take some food stamps, I'd be locked up probably down on death row again. 
But this is, this, is, this is race, and that's what is used to keep the communities divided. We are too small to be in our different silos talking about how we're going to do something. And we have to be vocal about it. So that's it. And uh, I guess I sit here and we change over. I have no idea what time it is. So Let's give Dr. Sellers another round of applause, everyone. Um, welcome back. Uh, my name is Louis Venters. I'm a professor of history here at Francis Marion. I teach African and African diaspora history and public history. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to add my words of welcome uh, to everyone today and to thank uh, our distinguished keynote speaker uh, and our panelists. I'll introduce them in just a moment. Uh, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask each one of them to share uh, some thoughts, uh, some initial thoughts about uh, things that Dr. Sellers uh, might have mentioned in his talk that struck them related to our theme of uh, race and culture and education for today. But I'd like to start. I have the microphone. <clears throat> um, Dr. Sellers, one of the things that, that struck me most of the images you shared uh, was that of um, Emmett Till and his, his, his face and his coffin. Um, <clears throat> this is not all about me, certainly, but I, I just I, I felt need to voice um, my own grief at this moment because just a, a, a few weeks ago, uh, my very dear friend who, who I called a brother uh, was, was murdered in New Orleans under circumstances that are still very, uh, very unclear. He was a real activist and servant of humanity uh, from Charleston. Um, some of you may know his name, Mohyedin Moye. Um, <clears throat> and I, uh, I buried him just, uh, just a couple weeks ago. And by that I mean I was privileged to help um, wash and prepare his body in accordance with our religious uh, tradition. And, uh, and, and his family and loved ones, we gathered and, and, and lowered his body into the ground, and, and we used, we did it kind of the old-fashioned way, the hands-on kind of way, uh, with shovels and with our hands, we put, we put the earth to cover his coffin while we sang. Um, so I guess I, I just needed to speak. I, I wanted to talk about it yesterday and the day before uh, on, on, on our program about grief and about trauma and about pain. And I think it just needs to be spoken more uh, that many of us, many of us carry trauma and grief. Some of it is very present. Some of it is older. Um, I don't know that it all goes away. Um, I think that as a group, as a society in South Carolina, we are a traumatized people. There's grief that we have experienced. There's trauma that we've experienced as victims and as perpetrators and as bystanders that are innocent or not so innocent. Um, and when Dr. Sellers talks about the Orangeburg Massacre as a litmus test for our sincerity, a litmus test for whether or not we choose to move into the future as one people or as divided people, divided from each other and divided in our own consciousness. I think that that's very much the case. The Orangeburg Massacre, the more recent violence that we've experienced, the older violence that we've experienced, going back through all the lynchings, all the mob violence, all the way back to the days of slavery and the extirpation of Native Americans from South Carolina. There's a lot we have to account for, a lot we have to talk about. I, please forgive me. I beg your indulgence. I needed to talk about that myself. Let me please introduce our, our very dear and distinguished um, panelists. You have met Dr. Sellers already. Um, I'd like to just say, uh, by, by way of a personal note, that, uh, that he was the director of African American Studies at Carolina when I was a graduate student there. And as I think you have uh, uh, figured out from his presentation, the best way to learn about the Civil Rights Movement is to hang out with people who were there. In, in my case, it was having him come to dinner uh, with my uh, class on civil rights and, uh, and talking for hours, uh, one of the highlights of, of my graduate, graduate studies. Um, I'd also like to introduce um, Val Littlefield. Valinda Littlefield is the current director of African American Studies 
uh, and an associate professor of history at USC, and she was one of my professors when I was there. I would like to say, I don't know, I see some of my students here. For any of those who are still reluctant and wonder, does a white man have uh, any excuse to teach uh, African American history, I would like you to direct your complaints to Cleve and Val, because they should have pulled the plug a long time ago, um, if that's the case. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Herb Frazier. Uh, you see uh, his biography as well, distinguished journalist here in South Carolina, and uh, you may also know him as one of the co-authors of We Are Charleston, uh, a work that was published as, as a part of ca catharsis and healing uh, after the Charleston massacre. Um, and uh, I met him just recently uh, in conjunction with his service on the uh, Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission. That's something that you don't find in his printed biography that I'd like to mention. Um, and Mayor Riley, um, I've just now met him, but as a historic preservationist, I feel like I share with all others in my profession around the country, I, we, we all feel like we know Joe Riley, a uh, very long, long, long time uh, mayor of Charleston, um, and uh, for, for, for good and for ill and for things that we're not sure about yet, responsible uh, in one way or another for a lot of the transformation of the city of Charleston that it's experienced really over the, over the past uh, half century. Uh, we're, we're delighted to have uh, all of these people here today, and I'd like to, um, to ask the, we've, we've heard from Dr. Sellers already, but I'd like to ask the other panelists if you could respond in you know, a minute or two with some of your thoughts, um, to uh, response to, to something maybe that struck you from, uh, from Dr. Sellers' uh, talk and our, in our theme here, uh, race, culture, and education. I'd like to start with Dr. Littlefield because frankly, she's the smartest person on the stage. <laughs> sure. Two things stuck out uh, that Cleveland said. In the very beginning of his talk, he said, he felt like the civil rights movement had moved back to 1953, this present time. And that was a very profound statement um, that should move us to do some things. The second thing that he said was, changing the narrative is the key. And how do you change the narrative? The need to shift ideology, the importance of having a strategy to do that. Uh, again, two very profound things that started me thinking about how I was going to respond uh, to his talk. And one of the things that is problematic with changing the narrative is that there's always someone else who wants to change it back or wants to move it in a different direction. And so you, you have to constantly be active. And one of the things that Cleve said is that you know, he's done a lot. This next generation and, and the rest of us need to step up and do some things. And that is important because the isms do not disappear. Racism, sexism, ageism, they go nowhere. We'd like to think that they do, but they never totally disappear. And so it means that we have to always be on guard and we have to always be ready to take that challenge. When we think about uh, Cleveland's uh, very brilliant talk that he gave today, changing the narrative, when I think about education, I think about 1868, when you have a group of people who fight for universal education. Then I think about that narrative changing again by the time we get to the 1880s, 1890s, who gets access to education again. That's what I'm talking about, changing of the narrative. Brown versus Board of Education comes out. Then we've got the Southern Manifesto, which Strom Thurmond was one of the major writers of. Again, changing that narrative back and forth. It also reminds me of one other thing, and then I'm gonna give my minute up. Lonnie Grineo reminded us that African Americans are the canaries in the mine. And for you young people, the canary was put down in coal mines and other mines to figure out if there was gas, if it was safe for the miners to actually go down. If the canary came back up dead, it's not safe, all right? So what Lonnie is telling us is, we're your canary in the mines. And I use the situation we're in now with the opioid situation. If in the 70s, 80s, and 90s we had dealt with the drug problems mm -hmm. that inner cities <clears throat> were having, we would not be where we are today. And so when you think about the isms, racism, sexism, and all of those, they leave a negative hole 
for future generations to have to dig themselves out of. And I think Cleveland's life and his legacy points that out to us in a very vivid way. Thank you. Dr. Sellers, your uh, presentation was very powerful. We all know that wor uh, pictures are worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. I think to see those images during the Civil Rights Movement and you having participated in it really gave an authenticity to your presentation. You talked about social consciousness and you talked about that we are now in this country divided in our respective silos. I'd like to take those two points. When I, I had the privilege of uh, serving or, or studying at the University of Michigan as a Michigan Journalism Fellow uh, in the 92-93 school year. And when I was at uh, the University of Michigan, I used my time as a journalist there, it was a journalism fellowship, to study the civil rights movement because I was not in South Carolina or in the United States during the height of the civil rights movement. My father was in the Navy and he was transferred in 1965 to the U.S. Naval Base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So we looked at all of those events from afar. And so when I returned to Charleston in 1969, I came back on the tail end of the hospital strike in Charleston. And as a journalist, I've written about that. I've written about the civil rights movement and I've written about uh, a lot of the events that you talked about. And our good friend Jack McRae was on the campus at South Carolina State uh, the night when those three students were killed. At Michigan, I felt as though that, and I, and I talked to faculty about the idea that as a result of desegregation, we'd lost our social consciousness. We'd lost as a community our compass because there was no urgency as we see now. I think, the civil, I think desegregation probably was one of the things that has caused a disintegration of that social consciousness in the black community. And I've been struggling and talking to people over the years of how can you recapture that sense of community that we need to focus on the issues as a people that hold us together. Pure and simple, Spring Street in Charleston used to be the Auburn Avenue mm -hmm. of, of uh, Charleston, lined with black businesses. But no offense, Mr. Mayor, uh, gentrification has changed that. Mm -hmm. I know there's a reason for trying to improve the city to, inc to increase the tax base, but there was a negative side to that in the city of Charleston. In closing, yes, we do have these two separate silos, and I'm wondering whether or not some of these lessons, uh, people have been dealing with these lessons for generations for a long time, and, 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 uh, and, and I think some new answers are coming uh, to the forefront that I think we ought to embrace, particularly when you speak about the two silos. Reverend William Barber with the Moral Majority in, in, in uh, North Carolina, he is doing just what you say. He is going into those Appalachian communities. He's going into those black rural communities. He is trying to get people who don't look like each other to understand that they have a common interest to work together because economics is the key. And I think that is one of the things. And then, of course, tying it into education. I grew up um, studying history out of this book, The History of South Carolina by Mary Sims Oliphant. Lord, in which us all. Yeah. Hmm? I said, Lord, help us all. I, yeah. <laughs> yes. And that's the key. You know, we all know what was, what was written in this book about people of African descent and slavery. And you all know, those of you who teach history, you know that the, uh, the new social studies standards apparently has not done enough to try to correct the wrongs of the past. So I think that there is going to be a public comment period coming up real soon. And I think the public needs to speak out and let the State Department of Education know that, yes, this is a painful history, but we must be honest and truthful about it in order that everyone can understand what, what we need to do as a people. So. Thank you. Mayor Riley. I had the uh, privilege of uh, having Dr. Sellers at the Citadel a few weeks ago uh, for wonderful presentation and inspired the students and that it was open to the community. Uh, and and, and I, my response to Dr. Sellers' presentation today or then is that we all are in search of heroes. Uh, for ourselves, for our community, for our country. And I think the Cleveland Sellers heroic 
story is so important now. He was a teenager uh, at Howard University, uh, easy life, if you will, and left for the 9.33 a week at best uh, to the fear of, of Mississippi uh, and the chance of being killed to the harsh, difficult times economically and otherwise, and then all the tension that existed uh, within in the South and within the movement, all pressing and, and urging and, and striving to deal with the, with the challenges of racism and brutality. And, and, and then with the little baby in his wife's arms spending nine months in jail for not only a crime he didn't commit, a crime that never occurred. And in, in that short period of time from a, a late teenager to a young, you know, not even close to being 30 years of old, that was such an, an opportunity for a person's destruction physical or through anger, and in withstanding all of that, then gets his education in after years, comes back to his hometown in Denmark, is president of the, of, of the college where he went to high school as a part of. And that's, um, that story is, is just so rich and so helpful always. It's timeless. Um, but, but for us now in our state and in this country, uh, it is very humble, soft-spoken, gentle man to remember we don't have to look far to find heroes. And we've got one right here. I want to ask but, please. you to share something. Cleveland, you told part of a story you had told me earlier about reading Sims, mm -hmm. civics book in class. Would you share with the audience what your teacher did with Sims? Um, <clears throat> the question that she asked you. Yeah, well, I, I, I was in a unique high school setting. I was on a college campus, on Voorhees College campus for high school because the state decided not to build a school for coloreds in uh, Denmark, and they would pay the college a tuition for, for all the students to go there. So our students were, were, I mean, our teachers were trained, many of them, at the teacher training institutions, and they knew that they had a job, a, a, a real major job, to uh, teach us how to navigate through a, a fledging new world um, with segregation still intact. And so the teacher just, when we asked about it, she decided to take some time and just go over it. Let us, you know, examine what happened, know the story, know all the details and that kind of thing. And then talk about not how do you get even, but how do you address the issue of injustice, a uh, uh, discriminatory judicial system and the inhumanity issue that comes along with that. How can somebody just kill a teenager and not think very much about it? I mean, it, life went on and everybody else went on. Plus, in Mississippi, and I'm not sure I have all my facts in a row right now in terms of South Carolina, but when the Emmett Till jury came back in, they said essentially that no uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant should ever be charged with the killing of a black person. And so they didn't have those kinds of laws in South Carolina. It was understood that if you kill a black person, you just admit it, go to court, and they'll let you go. 
Um, and that didn't change until you began to get the violation of civil rights. You know, that's what they ended up getting the people on that killed the three uh, students that I was talking about. Only then could you get any kind of charge against them uh, for um, if any kind of charge could be brought against them for murdering a black person. Now, I, I think that we find that in Mississippi that didn't change until about the mid 90s. And at the point where they decided to go back and, and reinvestigate cases. But, um, you know, the teacher took her time to explain to us who Emmett Till was. It was us, each of us. We all had a responsibility in responding to what had happened and that there was no need to get angry and throw rocks and all those kind of things. So what you had to do is you had to come up with something that you were gonna do that would make a difference. One of the things is go to college and, and, and become a professional and, and find out how you could become a lawyer and maybe change the way the law actually works in regards to African Americans. So that was, a, that was a, a tremendous session. That didn't go on in all of the black schools in South Carolina, however. But it did go on at our institution, and I think that that was one of the critical pieces that kind of shaped me in knowing that I had to take that um, Emmett Till murder in real consideration. And so for many students, college students, when the sit-ins came, they knew that that was the jump-off point. They, they knew that they, it was time to go. And this was one of the things that you could do that would lead to another, to another, to another one. And then you find a way and a strategy to get to the bigger things, like the right to vote, and then the right to live, and the right to identity and, and culture and those kinds of things. Uh, thanks to all of you, and, and I think y'all have the impression that we could easily spend an hour speaking with just, just one of, of our guests. So the fact that y'all were all able to limit your initial comments is, is most impressive and I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and, and the only reason I asked them to, to be brief is because we really want to uh, have an exchange and, and I wonder what kind of questions and comments uh, uh, are in the audience. We have a microphone here and is there one over? On that side, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, so please, um, what are your thoughts? Our, our theme today is race, culture, and education. Um, what are your questions? What are your comments for, for any of our guests? And if you'd identify who you are and, yeah. I'll jump in. My name is Reverend Mary Finkley, and I serve as a Lutheran pastor. In response to the Abbeville court case, my bishop joined with the Roman Catholic bishop, with the Methodist bishop, with the AME bishop in supporting and advocating for public education. What I worry about is that the faith community is being asked to do what the legislature is failing to do. Mm. And it puts many of us in a tough spot in wanting to support our local schools, um, teachers, principals, etc but um, without taking away the responsibility of the state. So I'm curious to your advice or wisdom and how we can, I don't want to say take advantage of this moment, but at the same time that court case revealed that we are not providing minimally adequate education. And if that's our standard for success, <laughs> I, I think that we, ha we have a higher calling to answer to, to that and I'm curious to your thoughts, thank you. Well, I'll comment on that. Um, in the book, We Are Charleston, we touched on an organization in Charleston called the Charleston Area Justice Ministries, which we just called CAJM. Um, CAJM is an interfaith organization, multiracial, and they were around before the tragedy at Mother Emanuel. And they were very important in bringing the community together with the help of the city and the police department to have a series of peaceful marches, prayer vigils, and to start the process of healing. As it relates to the city, as it relates to education, KGM has done some extraordinary work in trying to come up with best practices to deal with the uh, phenomenon of unwarranted police stops, uh, uh, 
Now they're dealing with housing issues in the city of Charleston. They've dealt with things, uh, um, uh, um, uh, workers in the hospitality community who are not getting their wages. But as it relates to education, they've done work with restorative justice because of the high incidence of um, uh, um, ex expulsions in the schools. So I think there definitely is a role to play. And I think that they, they work with local leaders in, in Charleston. I, that, that conversation, I don't believe, has been taken to the legislature in Columbia. I think maybe that's the next level. Uh, but you've got to start local. And that's one way to do it. Let me uh, deal with it quickly as I possibly can. I did a study with a uh, group when I was on the State Board of Education of why black males were so proficient at scoring 20 points a game, uh, three or four touchdowns, uh, whatever it might be. but on science and math and all those other kinds of things, it seems that they couldn't, couldn't achieve. So we were trying to find out what we needed to do to increase the achievement level. What we found was, was that in South Carolina, and this was in 95, the last time I've seen it, and I don't think they even give the statistics any longer, that 82% of the dropouts, 82%, had two or more retentions. And I said, well, that, that sounds OK, but you know, we have focused in on middle school. We want to catch it then, and we want to turn them around and all that kind of thing. But when we looked at it, what we found out was, was that 25% of African male, African-American males in kindergarten, 25%, were not considered ready for first grade. 19% of African American females were not considered ready for first grade. So before the child actually starts the school, they got one, one retention. Before they actually get into the school setting, one retention. And between the first and the fourth grade, there's a high likelihood that they will get the second retention. So we can already tag that individual and see them when they get to the 10th grade, they're not coming back again. They will do something that will put them out of school forever in the day. And uh, when I remember that when I was talking about this kind of thing, Bakari was a young boy. Um, maybe about 10, and he was saying he thought that to get out of kindergarten, all you had to do was color in between the lines. And I said, well, that's what I thought too. But anyhow, it's systemic why we have these, these kind of issues and problems. But you can take a kid <clears throat> that hadn't had very much education, and you can give them a playbook. You know what a playbook is for football? And they will remember the numbers, the counts, the movements, which direction they go, and all that kind of stuff. And they can't, they can't, they can't do basic mathematics. I, I, I believe it's deliberate. So what I'm suggesting is, is that you have to talk about systemic change in those institutions. If we're going to just modernize them and make them look better, and we're not going to change the content, but I think that if you go back and look at the Southern Manifesto, you will find that there was a commitment on the part of the Southern states that they weren't going to do anything to increase the scholarship and the education, the quality of education for minorities. The, uh, <clears throat> I think it's the most important issue in South Carolina, uh, quality education yes. for every child. And every child can learn. Every child can learn. Um, the socially and economically challenged child can learn. Every child can learn. And it's a, it's a failure uh, of community and society when the child doesn't learn. And, and quality, our early childhood is essential. 
and, and so helpful, uh, it, it's vital. And, uh, and then quality teachers and, and principals and superintendents funded better and led better, uh, no excuses for mediocrity in any element of that. And uh, we work, the cities don't run schools, as you know, uh, and, uh, but we have chance to we work with them, and we've worked with a number of nonprofits and, uh, and after school programs and, and, and remedial programs and those kind of things, and uh, work with the, you know, helping provide the land for Meeting Street Academy, which was a, a private school for inner city kids. And, um, and that worked so well, there was some timidity about the city helping that, you know, that's really, you know, the school district should be doing that and everything. And, um, and now our school district is contracted with the Meeting Street Academy to operate a school in a very challenged, socially and economically challenged uh, neighborhood in North Charleston. And so they hooked that school over completely public school and all of that, and the, the, grade, the, the uh, grade increases off the chart. So the, the fact is we cannot accept uh, any thought that, that uh, some children who cannot learn, every child can learn. And when we commit to that and everyone believes it and we fund it to a level that is necessary to achieve excellence, then things really start to change. I'll be very brief, and I'm happy to hear faith-based, uh, anytime faith-based faith -based institutions are involved. I think we cannot wait on the state leaders to do very much. Uh, they've already shown their hand. We, we know what they think. And so when you know what somebody thinks and you live in a glass house, then you have to act like you live in a glass house. So we need to take care of that problem. And I think faith-based institutions, they used to play a huge role, especially the African-American churches. We taught our kids because we knew the state was not going to provide the money. And so you had Sunday school teachers teaching reading and writing. I mean, it was, through, it was throughout the community. And I think communities have to look at that. What can I do as an institution, as a faith-based institution, to change the narrative of what my kids in my community are learning. We got the money, we got churches on every corner. And I mean, we're talking mega churches to small churches. Use some of that money we're collecting to make sure our kids get an education and give them scholarships to go to college. I would like to chime in one more time because if I don't mention this, I might not be able to go home. Uh, my wife is an early childhood educator uh, she runs a uh, First Steps program in Berkeley County, and she speaks about this every day. We need to pay more attention to those zero to five, those kids, because that's when their brains are developing. And she talks passionately about the need to touch them and embrace them, because it's through that human touch that the, that the and she can tell you better than I, that there's something going on in their minds that help them to absorb information and finally, um, to you college students who are no longer wanting to be cuddled, um, I'll tell you one thing that you ought to do. You ought to learn another language because I have been blessed that I've traveled this world as a journalist. And no matter what country I go in, people speak their local language and they speak English and they speak their local languages. And we can no longer think that we're gonna be competing with the person next to you. You're gonna be competing with the person on the other side of the world for a job. So learn another language and get out of this country and experience something other than America. Very yeah. Good. Yeah. Yes, yes. Are there other uh, comments or questions from the audience? Don't be scared. <laughs> Let, let me, um, before the question, well, if there's a question, but let me, let me say this. I've got, um, when I go back to, I've got about a two hour plus drive to Charleston, and it would be a very long drive for me if I get in that car and know that I did not tell you about the International African American Museum. Uh, thank so I'll you. do that yeah. quickly, and it's about what we're talking about today. And, and that is this that a, I believe, I know, a societal structural defect in America is. 
that we do not know African American history. The old fat book and other books told our truths about it. Uh, our country is, was not, not, not met a reconciliation. Uh, we don't know, we don't understand. We, all of us, white, African American, Native, we all need to embrace and understand this history. So in Charleston, where 48.1% of all enslaved Africans came to North America came, we realized it was our duty to help present this history. And we're going to present it in this museum on the site that was once Gadsden's Wharf, the largest wharf in the colonies and where many of the enslaved Africans that came to Charleston were brought. And then what the museum does, will do, is reach back into Africa. So then we, we learn the rich, varied cultures and civilizations that existed there. You know, those books made you think there was some race of slaves who were captured, they were brought here, you know, baloney. They were captured, the brave and, and bright, creative people, and they were captured. So we understand the very civilized Western Africa and then come through here and, and be confronted with what it was really like to work on a rice field, to create a rice field with the alligators and the, and the snakes and no mechanized equipment, and to transform these wetlands into the most productive money-making acre of land in North America, all on the backs uh, of enslaved Africans. And then through the lens of Charleston, that story, the story as we see through ours from, from, from enslavement, you know, the workhouse at, on Magazine Street, where the workhouse is where if your slave wasn't doing good, you sent him there to get, you know, punished. Uh, all the, the lands of the slave, res, the resistance. And, and then, you know, obviously emancipation. And then what really was reconstruction life and then the Iron Curtain like Jim Crow coming down. And, uh, and, and all of that. And so we will, in this, in this museum on this sacred site, allow all who come, and then we will develop curriculum to get into the school room so the kids learn, you know, that, that if you learn in grammar school the truth about this history, it's less, that person is less apt to be uh, sucked in to racism. So anyway, that's, uh, we're working hard on it. I work on it every day. Uh, we're going to build it, and, and it's going to be a, a, a very important, prideful institution in our state that will help, will, will uh, directly benefit our country. So how do you get that in? Thank, thank you for sharing that, because I'm sure there are some people who aren't aware of this new development. Um, it's in the the, the fundraising and planning stages, but, but moving, uh, moving along well, quite we, nicely. Uh, we, our hope is to begin construction in late summer. We've got some more fundraising to do and working with the state, but we're, uh, the, the design is finished, and, um, and we're hopefully to get underway then. It, that also speaks to a, just a, a, a thought that I had, if, um, if I may. It, it, you know, the, the, in our discussions yesterday and the day before as well, I, it, it occurred to me that we, we have to we have to train ourselves to avoid dichotomous thinking. You know, as a public historian, I appreciate that we're talking. You know, we at first we were talking about the the public education system, our formal education system. But then education is is more than just that, and so a museum setting is also education. It's not one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yesterday there was a discussion: are are we interested in forgiveness or are we interested in injustice? And my thinking was, well, why can we not? talk about both of these things at the same time. Why does it have to be one or the other? Is it, is it religion or is it politics? Well, it's, you know, the, the African-American tradition is that it's, it's everything all, all wrapped up together, right, uh, on, on earth as it is in heaven. Um, so, so avoiding dichotomies and being able to walk and chew gum at the same time to be able to think about, you know, another dichotomy that, that often comes up is our, um, there's... Uh, you know, individual racism, individual prejudice, or should we be talking about s systemic racism? Right. Lord have mercy, we've got to talk about both and, right. Right. right? Because who makes up systems except individuals, groups of individuals, right? So is it the way we think or is it the way we act? It's, so I, 
that's my two cents. Uh, there, there's got to be some more, uh, more comments and questions. And we'll probably run a little over time. I had authorization from the boss man that we could, we could the, be a little fuzzy on the end. Yeah. Um, my name is Bernadette Johnson. I'm a reference librarian here at uh, Francis Marion University. My question is for Mr. Herb Frazier. I'd like to know your experience in Cuba, like your educational experience, and did you witness and encounter any racism while you were in Cuba? Well, that's a very good question because I just recently wrote about it and I think about it all the time. Now, keep in mind, when I went to Guantanamo, it was March 1965. Schools in Charleston were segregated. Daddy got a transfer. We went to Guantanamo and I went to William T. Sampson High School, which was a predominantly white school <clears throat> on the naval base. And there was really no uh, problem at all. Um, I had one little incident where um, the son of the base's lawyer, the JAG officer, he called, he used the N word, and I punched him, and that was the end of that. Made daddy quite nervous because he thought maybe we were going to get kicked off the base. But that was the only, that was the only incident. And of course, as I mentioned, we were looking at the civil rights movement and the events of the civil rights move movements from afar, and I remember distinctively that, that night, April 1968, when it came over the television that Dr. King had been assassinated, and Daddy slammed his fist on the dining room table, and he cursed, and that was the first time I'd heard him say a curse word. Now, I knew he'd said curse words before. He's a sailor, after all. <laughs> but he never used those kind of words in the house, and that's, I knew something profound had happened. And then I moved, and well, also then by living on the naval base, we could not go to the communist Cuba, quote, but I watched uh, black and white, sketchy black and white television of Fidel Castro giving these long, long epic speeches in Revolution Square. But one thing that I noticed about Cuba in, in the 60s, it was an integrated dais when he was given the speech. And there were black people and white people seated behind him. And, you know, we always had this sense that Cuba was a white country. No, it's a very black country. And since then, I've traveled to, to Haiti and I've reported, not Haiti, I'm sorry, I've been to Haiti too, but I traveled to Havana mm -hmm. and, and, and I've written about the cultural connections between Havana and Charleston. And not to bore you and carry on, because it is a long story, because there are a migration of Gullah people who left South Carolina, colonial South Carolina, went to Florida, and then some went to Cuba and some went to uh, the Bahamas and other parts of uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere. So there is... Uh, a connection between people throughout the Atlantic community, and so I've written about that. And Cuba is a fascinating culture, music, food, and just. And the one final thing, everybody reads. They read in, in Havana. You see everybody with grandma, the newspaper, reading the paper. You know, we don't read enough. I'll just add a couple of things about Cuba. I was there last year and we had some uh, Cuban folks, um, colleagues who came to USC this year. Uh, they are dealing with race. Its, it's head is bubbling up some. Uh, and part of that is because with, the, with Castro, yeah. um, that you know, race was not supposed to be a problem. But it is a problem, color especially, and they are dealing with that. And so there are groups who are, are fighting it head on um, and, and are very, advocates for making sure that people of color get the same rights as those who are lighter skinned. And so it, it's an interesting place and he's absolutely right. The food and I mean, it's, it's a great place. For those of you who have not been to Cuba, go. And I might add, they're dealing with race around the issue of money because yes. you look at that thriving hospitality community, mm -hmm. the people, Cubans now can have what they call paladars, mm -hmm. restaurants in their homes. You go and they work in the hospitality community. But the lighter skinned Cubans work in the bigger hotels. Darker skinned Cubans don't get those jobs. So therefore, they're interacting with Westerners, Americans, and they're getting dollars, or they're getting you know, more valuable currency where dark skinned Cubans don't get that. And I think, I agree, there is going to be a very, very, uh, and there's going to be a clash, an economic and social class in Cuba if the government is not able to identify it and rectify it. One, one or two more. My name is Wilma H. Epps. My question is, is do you think that the 
think that the real or imagined Willie Lynch leathers have an effect on racism today and within our own culture. She was talking about the Willie Lynch letter. She was talking about the Willie Lynch letter. Oh. Oh, I, I think we probably need to leave Willie Lynch letter alone. We haven't been able to verify that. That's more of a, um, what is, what is that? That's no, why I said real or imagined. From, uh, real or imagined. Or real or imagined. Yeah. Yeah, but what was the name of the thing that they wrote? Steel put together? Oh, the dossier. The dossier. dossier. Steel dossier. When you say real or imagined, repeat your question for me one more time. Let's make sure I'm. Do you think that it that it has an effect on the current policies that are that are the current policies or the past policies and within our own race? Okay. Be more specific. Give me an example. Okay. A few minutes ago, you, you said something about the light-skinned Cubans and mm -hmm. the dark-skinned Cubans. Mm -hmm. So you, you're bringing it home. You're bringing yes. it home. Yes. yes, we are still dealing with that. I totally agree. Um, there is a wonderful documentary out on a group of black women talking about, and I don't know if you've seen that one, but talking about, these are dark-skinned women, talking about how color is still impacting the African-American community. Um, you, one of the girls you know, is in tears talking about her mother said, if you were just lighter, you know, you wouldn't have to go through certain things. And she recognized that. But for her mother to say that to her was just another added knife. Uh, she can get that from other people and maybe deal with it on another level, but your mother is saying that. And, and that, so what I'm saying is within the family, Yes, we still have some issues within the African American community to deal with, and color is one of them. And do you also think it affects policies? Yes, I think it affects, I think it impacts policies, but I think it impacts more access. Who gets access to certain things? Who is more comfortable? If a light skinned person walks into a room, a group may take them differently than they would a person who is dark skinned. Doesn't matter, it's all about the color. And so I think access to certain things, who gets to be promoted, who gets to be uh, in the boardroom, who gets to be, uh, you know, if you're looking at Harlem, if, if you go back to the 1920s and you're looking at Harlem, who are the dancers? You had to be a certain color. If you're talking about Louisiana, it's the paper bag test. Yes, we're still dealing with that. And we still, in many ways, we have when we think about policies and we think about other things, we still have cosmetic organizations, corporations, who are making billions of dollars off of promoting light skin in India, in Africa, all sorts of places, and it, in Brazil, it's killing us because you're bleaching your skin, and when you go to the hospital, you can die because your skin is so thin. We're killing ourselves. And there are commercials out there that show that. And, and Still dealing with it. The issue of, of, of cultural representation is, is certainly very important. And I, we could be here till next week talking about the, the, these issues. But uh, just to, to put in two cents for um, the achievement of uh, Ryan Coogler uh, with, uh, with Black Panther, yeah. you know, just, just to place that film into some context. Um, it's, it's, it's very impressive, uh, the representations of people of African descent mm -hmm. on the big screen. Uh, it's, it's, it's major news. Yeah, I was we, gonna mention Black Panther, yeah. if you gotta go see it. And one other thing, as far as just recently and 10 years ago, my father asked me, <clears throat> why do you wanna serve on the advisory board at the Avery, Inst Avery Institute at, at the College of Charleston? Because when daddy was a little boy, they wouldn't let him in the Avery when it was a school because he was too dark. And he, re and, and he reminded me of that. But uh, yeah, so very much an element in Charleston, too. Yeah. Um, I think one, one more question, and then we should probably continue our discussions um, with food. Hi, my name is Anna Patton, and I'm a student here at Francis Marion. I heard it was said that by the time a student is African-Americans in 10th grade, they'll try to do anything to get out of school forever. 
Uh, my friend Delante and I are actually going to be middle school and high school teachers. So what advice can you give us to help ensure our students stay in school? Uh, one of the things you can do is raise the level of expectation. Yes. Uh, that would help. And then the other is be the best teacher that you can be. Because all the kids can learn. They just aren't given the opportunity and put into situations where they will be able to push just a little bit more. I remember the school in Chicago, I forget the woman's name, she died, but she... Martha, Martha Collins. Yeah, Martha. Uh, she was able to get kids like in second and third grade who could actually begin to do calculus and, and, and the, the higher maths and the higher sciences too. And that makes a difference. I, you know, you just have to push kids and get them out of this, this kind of uh, mediocrity is, is the best I can do and I'm uh, end up doing less than that most of the time. But let me just say one other thing, and that is we sat and watched communities be destroyed, whatever group it is, because you know, we, we, we saw the wave of anti-intellectualism kind of come in and, and take over and talk about what the schools need to be doing and what the colleges need to be doing. And uh, we, we got rid of any notion about philosophy and uh, now we're dealing with facts and whose facts are the right facts and truth and all those kinds of things. There used to be discussions about all of that and we used to be a part of that. And we did have communities. That's what we don't have now, because we've broken them down and we let them disintegrate. And now everybody's talking about community. Where's the community? There is no more. And for young people, the focus was on individualism and materialism. And that was pushed and pushed and pushed to the point now where kids stick out their hands so they even start doing anything. And so we have to go back in and, and talk about value adjustments and cultural identity and those kind of things all over again so that we can begin to build community again. If you don't build community again, you got people all over the place that are against each other today and in another tribe tomorrow and against somebody and, and we never get back to community and the value of a community in a multiracial uh, society. I would just like to add one other thing um, as, a, as a middle school teacher is get to know your kids. Um, get to know them in different settings. Uh, we, we tend to think of our kids um, only in, in the classroom, but what else are they doing outside of the classroom and how do you get to know that? Then if you're in that community, and I'm putting community in quotation marks because Dr. Sellers is absolutely right, but kids are in churches. They're in all sorts of other things. and so. Sometimes you see a kid in church doing things and you think that kid's not meeting their potential in the classroom, but they just got up there and gave a dynamite speech. But I can't get them to do that in class. Then you can start figuring out where's the disconnect. Why can't I as a teacher get that kid to do that? If the church people can get him to do that, why can't I get him to do that? So you, that's what I'm saying. You have to put yourself in places where you see your kids in different situations so you get to know your kids a little better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you to, to our, our panelists and thank you for these really excellent questions. I think just in, in closing, um, I think it's, it's very fair to say that all we've done in, in three days is uh, advance our understanding a little bit, get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, we're not done uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so I encourage us to continue these conversations uh, in all kinds of different configurations uh, in our neighborhoods and our places of work uh, here at the university and elsewhere uh, around our area. Um, this has been really, really, uh, truly wonderful for Francis Marion and thank you all for participating. Please, um, please remember your evaluation forms uh, when you're in a position to thank anybody from South Carolina Humanities, uh, please do so for their support of this three-day symposium. Uh, and I'd invite everyone to uh, continue to talk with our, our guests uh, over refreshments out in the lobby. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.